Greetings, and welcome to this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Laws, offered by Wise Council Research. The Laws is Plato's longest dialogue. I'm going to try to offer it my briefest introduction. The Laws is the only Platonic dialogue where Plato's teacher, Socrates, is not present. Its interlocutors are a Cretan named Cleinias, a Spartan named Megillus, and an unnamed Athenian stranger, someone who sounds a lot like Socrates, but is never identified as such. Now, the Laws is also the only Platonic dialogue that takes place outside of a city, except for the dialogue the Phaedrus, and it is the only one of all of the dialogues that takes place apart from the city of Athens. It is set on the island of Crete, on a path leading up to a holy place, a temple of Zeus. The Laws' first word is God, which also happens to be the last word of Plato's dialogue, The Apology of Socrates. The topic of the dialogue is, no surprise, laws. Now, the standard teaching of classical political philosophy is that laws grow out of something more fundamental, the regime, or in Greek, politeia. For example, a democratic regime would give rise to democratic laws, an aristocracy to aristocratic laws, and so on. Now, regime, or politeia, is also the title of Plato's most famous dialogue, which we translate, following the Romans, as the Republic. So the Republic looks like it is the more fundamental of the two dialogues, because it takes up the question of the regime, what is the best regime, while the laws seemingly takes up the more secondary question about the best laws. However, as I mentioned, the laws begins with this word God. The opening question of the dialogue is, a God or some human being, O strangers, which is the cause for you of the setting down of the laws? Now this opening question suggests that Plato did not want us to simply assume that the regime is more fundamental than and the cause of the laws. Perhaps laws do not come from the regime. As strange as, as strange as it sounds to our secular ears, maybe the law does ultimately come from some superhuman or even supernatural source. After all, that's what we learn from the Torah, from the New Testament, and from the Quran. And it's what all the cities in Greece at Plato's time also believed. Perhaps God is the ultimate source of the laws and then, secondarily, of the regime. If that's the case, then the inquiry into the laws would be more fundamental than the inquiry into the regime. And this inquiry into the laws would be of great importance not only to political philosophy, but also to philosophy proper, for it would concern the cause of everything. So even though the dialogue the laws presents a conversation among three old men, none of whom is identified as Socrates, it begins with the most fundamental question of any Platonic dialogue. Now the laws as a whole falls into two main parts. The first part is books one to three, and the second part are books four to 12. To put it very, very simply, books one to three examine what is. So books one and two examine the existing laws of Crete, especially the aims or purposes of the Cretan laws. And book three examines the natural preconditions for all regimes. The turning point of the dialogue comes at the end of book three, when Cleinias the Cretan reveals that he has been selected to lead the Cretan cities in setting up a new city, a colony, in Crete. He is a prospective founder. So books 4 through 12 turn away from the consideration of what is to discussing what could be a regime and laws based on very different purposes and very different principles than Crete's existing laws. It is a sign of how much the Athenian stranger must have impressed Cleinias and Megalus in books one through three, 
that Cleinias not only shares this opportunity that he has before him, but Cleinias remains engaged as the stranger proposes laws to him that bear very little resemblance to the laws of Cleinias's homeland. Books 4 through 12 themselves fall into two main parts. The first comprises books 4 through 8, the second books 9 through 12. In books 4 through 7, the stranger proposes laws for marriage, property, the offices of the new city, and, above all, for the education of the children born to the families who will inhabit this new city. Book 8 then descends from the serious topic of education to play. The stranger proposes laws regarding the city's holy festivals, and particularly laws regarding the citizens' sexual lives. Now it may come as a surprise then that in books 9 through 12, the stranger turns to the penal code, that is, the laws that concern the punishment of criminals. The very necessity for these laws seem to indict the laws that came before them. After all, if the new city's education were so very good, why then would some of its citizens go astray? Overall then, the laws as a dialogue ascends from the consideration of the existing laws of the existing regimes to the proposal of a new city, and above all, with its summit in Book 7, which concerns education. And then it descends first into a playful consideration in Book 8, and then more darkly into the penal code offered in Books 9 through 12. But even in, or perhaps especially in, the darkness of the penal code, there are two additional summits of a sort. The first occurs in Book 10, in which the stranger offers laws against impiety, and in particular, atheism. Now remember, at this time, all the Greek cities considered their laws as divine, so disbelief in the gods was the very worst of crimes. But the stranger is remarkably gentle in Book 10. First, he offers a sketch of the atheistic argument itself, so that argument will stand in the law code itself for all future citizens and all students of the law to read. Then he offers arguments against atheism and related forms of impiety, arguments rather than threats. Finally, he does offer laws punishing atheism and impiety, but his laws distinguish between atheists who are frank and decent people and those who would seek to trick and harm others. The decent atheists he would have, so to speak, punished by being required to spend five years in what he calls a moderation tank, discussing their atheistic beliefs with the most esteemed and intelligent of their fellow citizens. It sounds very much more like a school than a prison. Now this supposed punishment leads then to the second summit that occurs in the law's penal code. It is the most distinctive institution proposed by the stranger, the nocturnal council, as he calls it. This council is to be composed of the most esteemed and virtuous members of the city's leadership, each of whom will also bring with him a younger man to their discussions. The council will influence the city's governance, but the real focus of its discussion is not management. Rather, the council is to discuss the noble, the good, the divine, and above all, the unity of virtue. That is the question of how virtue can be both one thing as well as four things. That is courage, justice, moderation, and prudence. Now these discussions are crucial for politics. After all, how will the city aim at virtue if the city's leaders have no idea what virtue is. But the council's discussions are also defensible in their own right as the exercise of some of the highest capacities of the human soul. Again, at its height, this city seems to resemble a school. Over the years, many people have wondered if Plato's laws was meant to be a practical proposal for an actual city. Certainly, Plato devoted great attention to the many details of the laws that he proposes in this book. His goal was likely not only theoretical. 
But for our purposes today, perhaps the laws serves best as a point of comparison to better understand ourselves and our political life. For example, the city of the laws would aim above all at virtue, at the excellence of its people, both as individuals and as a community. In comparison, our politics is devoted to freedom above all. And freedom may include excellence or allow for it, but in practice, it often fosters conformity and frivolity. The city of the laws would urge its citizens to see their private good inextricably bound up in the public good. Our politics, in contrast, justifies public expense as serving above all the enjoyment of our private rights. Finally, as is well known, our politics is secular, treating religion as a private matter with little or perhaps no public ramifications. The laws, in contrast, continually poses the question of the place of the sacred or the divine within the civic realm. The laws does not assume an answer to that question, but it does suggest that a community that, as a matter of principle, exiles the gods would likely do great harm to the human beings who live within it. Thank you for viewing this brief introduction to Plato's Laws, offered by Wise Council Research. Please keep tuned for future offerings. Thank you.